Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. We should never be okay or acceptable that someone dies on the street because of temperature. Denver has a really robust model that works really well. If we go to the community, I don't know any neighborhood that would say yes. They oppose encampments in that area because they see it as deteriorating their uh, business environment. We knew anywhere we went there was going to be um, community backlash. I mean, nimbyism takes a whole nother, you know, move towards this whole new idea of bananaism, where no one wants anything absolutely anywhere at no time. I'm Sarah Fenske. Last year, St. Louis allocated $900,000 to a new project meant to serve the city's homeless residents. The project would be paid for by federal stimulus funds, and it would be the first city-funded encampment for homeless people. But the project may have hit a dead end. And joining me now to talk about it is Anthony D'Agostino. He is the CEO of the St. Patrick Center. Anthony, welcome. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So take us back. When you signed on to make a city-funded encampment happen, what did you have in mind? So we learned a lot over the last year of COVID uh, at St. Patrick Center because we actually were, before this even happened, put into a situation where we had to create a type of encampment. Um, Last summer, we had Interco Plaza. There were quite a few individuals who were encamping in the plaza, which is a park right next to us. And... um, It got to be to the point because of COVID restrictions and other issues, it got to be quite large, possibly a few dozen people, to the point where there were major safety and security risks. We had been working with the city, and at one point we just decided we were going to open up something called Camp Cole. And as you remember, we opened that up probably towards the end of the summer last year, and we ran it for three months. And it went really well. Um, We learned a lot about um, encampments and how they operate, how they run. We did research of other cities and best practices Mm -hmm. and um, really figured out, well, we could potentially do this long term. And, you know, I have to start by saying, you know, this is the first time in history the city and the administration decided they were going to give, you know, around a million dollars to an encampment. And that's never happened before. And that's really important. However, I do have to say there's two differences here. There's encampments like we think of. If you're listening to the radio right now, you're thinking, oh, an encampment, it's a bunch of tents, people living in this kind of unorganized group. What we're talking about is moving towards an intentional encampment or maybe not use the word encampment and say what we call them are community cabins or community housing, really a place where individuals can live um, outside, like kind of like with a tiny home or something mm-hmm. along those natures, uh, with services, with resources, with everything that's needed to help them become sustainably housed down the road. And, and these are people who maybe a homeless shelter wouldn't be a good fit. They just don't want maybe some of the restrictions that come along with that. Exactly. There are individuals right now, and I, I should also preface this, when people think of encampments, since the beginning of our founding of St. Louis back in the late 1700s, there have been encampments. There have been people living outside because of a variety of reasons, right? And so it's not like uh, we're talking about creating something that's not already here. There have been encampments. There will continue to be encampments until we create a situation where people who use encampments or create them will come to this place to this new community cabin or these tiny homes. So that's what we're trying to do, and we're working with the city to try to accomplish, or any other service provider who can help us do this. Other cities have done it. Mm -hmm. There's been huge successes in other cities, and we would like to bring that here and use those best practices and help people who can't go to other places. A lot of times behavioral issues, right? So shelters are different than intentional communities. Shelters have rules, regulations. Oftentimes you can't bring your personal belongings. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of restrictions that make it so people either don't want to go or can't go because they've been restricted or said that they are on a ban list and can't go into that shelter. So what do you do with those individuals? Let's say you have three, four dozen of those individuals. Do we just allow them to sleep out on the streets, especially in extreme cold? 
or do we set up a place where we know they can go and get services and potentially move towards more sustainable housing? So people that might be living on the street anyway, find a way to do it better, let them have access to things like uh, sanitation, things like that. Yes. And we need to have different options for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Not everyone lives in the same type of housing, apartments, homes, other places. It's based on your situation, uh, geography, and, and basically income and just mental and physical health. So we need to have that for our our clients that we work with, our unhoused neighbors. We need to have these options for people based on their situation. And so you had done this, as you say, for a few months last summer, this Camp Cole kind of a pilot project that you did because of necessity, but it, it feels like that mostly worked. You were ready to do it again. The city was ready to fund it. Mm -hmm. You even had a site in mind for it. Mm -hmm. Where were you going to do this? So we were going to do it... Uh, pretty close to where we currently are located at St. Patrick's Center because we realized that a lot of our clients, we've had to listen to them, that we're going to utilize it, wanted to stay somewhat close to the amenities or the services that we offered. So we were trying to find, there's two things that we figured out really quickly. This isn't really going to work in a, a residential neighborhood where people are living. This isn't probably going to work in a commercial area where there's a lot of businesses. So there's kind of one other area, and that's more industrial type areas. And so we looked around there, and we found one relatively close to us. Um, down by the water, you know, kind of around 70 Highway. And, um, it, you know, we were moving forward on that. I think we had some some potential there. We've looked at other spots too. Mm -hmm. um, the location is important, but really the whole goal is no matter where we go, we just want to make sure it's somewhere that can provide the services to keep people safe and moving into a more sustainable place. Okay. So you have this spot. Mm -hmm. um, I understand this is a privately owned lot. The mm -hmm. owner of the lot was on board for this. Then you ran into political opposition. Yeah, and we knew this was going to be an issue. We ran into this with Camp Cole, right? So when Interco was going on, it was really difficult to find anywhere we could do this. We found a very generous and supportive neighbor. Uh, Starwood actually uh, helped us um, use their facility to, to do this, Camp Cole, in a very short period of time. And then um, we kind of found that with... Um, uh, another uh, individual, Mike Scaruzzo, he helped, you know, has this place. He was really helpful. He's been helpful in other ways. He said, you can use this piece of land I have down here. Um, and so we, we worked through that process. But, you know, we knew anywhere we went there was going to be um, community backlash. I mean, uh, nimbyism takes a whole nother you know, move towards this whole new idea of bananaism, where no one wants anything absolutely anywhere at no time. And that especially comes up when you have this really supercharged word with stigma attached to it, like a encampment. Mm -hmm. um, so we've learned a lot through this process. And we proposed a tiny home community, a community cabin community, if you will. And, um, but it's still, you know, it's going to have it's going to be tough to get through. <laughs> it's going to be basically you're saying reading the political winds, yeah. you don't think you can do it. Um, I have hope. You right? still have hope. Yes, yeah, still have hope. Um, I, I, I really think that we can make this. I mean, there's a lot of pushback in the community. If we go to the community, I don't know any neighborhood that would say, yes, um, a tiny home community here is what we would vote for. Um, so I, I don't know the, the necessary chess moves here to go in this direction. Um, but, you know, we're open to, to doing anything we can to make sure this, because it's a need. Um, there are always going to be in this community, and people need to know this, there will never be a situation where there's not people who are going to need to be in a place where they can have this type of community. Mm -hmm. Like it's always – some people won't come in from being outside. Some people want their independence in this type of community. The combination of all these factors, there's always going to be a need for something like this. And our thought is in St. Louis, we should never – we should never be okay or acceptable that someone dies on the street because of temperature. And every winter we have that happen. Mm -hmm. That is not acceptable. And so we have the resources and the ability. The city's trying to make this happen. We want to work with them, and we just need to get the community going in this direction as well. So our producer, Kayla Drake, talked to Alderman James Page. He represents the Fifth Ward, um, and he opposes having this in the Fifth Ward. And that's where this site that you're talking about at First and Cass, it is in his ward. Here's what he told Kayla about that. I have met with and spoken with a number of business owners along the near North Riverfront and to a person they oppose 
encampments in that area because they see it as deteriorating their uh, business environment and providing uh, decreased security. Now, Alderman Page represents a ward that stretches from downtown into North City along I-70. He said his ward is saturated with homeless service providers. He wants other parts of the region to step up to shoulder a burden that has typically rested on north side wards. We have to be very sensitive to the needs, uh, the housing needs of our constituents, of our friends and neighbors, family members. But by the same token, I believe that we have an obligation to do that in strategic, humane uh, manners, if you will, and uh, and so that there is a sharing of uh, the responsibility for housing people. So that is Alderman James Page. He spoke with Kayla Drake just this morning. Is his opposition enough to just grind this plan to a halt? Well, so I... I I do want to preface this whole thing by saying James Page, we talk to him quite often. He's a great friend to not only St. Patrick Center, the community, but to our unhoused neighbors. He is trying really hard. Um, he's exactly right on a lot of points there. Uh, the north area, some of the north areas and wards are super saturated with a lot of the services. Um, on the other token, that that's a lot of the individuals who are unhoused are living in some of these wards. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we're not potentially talking about bringing new people into a ward, we're talking about just taking, let's say, an industrial area where you already have people unintentionally encamping and trying to create some resources and services around them in where they're already staying um, and not move them to other places. Um, but it is, there is an equitability issue, right? I mean, so it's it's inequitable across our city where things are located, where people live, and the resources they have, right? I mean, you see this, the Delmar Divide. Other things come up all the time with some of the, the health disparities and income disparities. We're having that issue. And I completely respect what he's saying and understand where he's coming from. Um, but if you're asking for a community to raise their hand and say, yes, have it here, I don't know where that's going to happen. Yeah. So... What about, so the 7th Ward um, also encompasses part of downtown. I know it's important to you that this is Mm -hmm. somewhat close to St. Patrick's Center, so these guys can get the services they're getting. Have you looked at a site there? Yeah, we've looked at several wards. We've gone actually south a little bit because of actually what Alderman Page and others in the North Ward have said about inequitable situations. And, you know, there's some possibilities, but once again, um, dozens and dozens of sites, potential sites, and not one of them has uh, come even close to where we got to with the current space uh, just north of us, uh, just north and east of us on Cass. But, you know, the the property, the spot is not, you know, while it's obviously very important, we need to get that community buy-in, we need to find that. The ultimate goal is, I mean, I don't fall in love with any of these particular spots. I really don't care about the property. I just want a spot where we can we can set up and we can actually create this. And I think a year from now, if we set it up, people are going to look back and say, wow, this this was great. Like it actually providing the services and resources, this actually improved the community. It improved the neighborhood because the neighborhood probably is already having some struggles. This will bring in a uh, St. Patrick Center service providers with expertise, and we'll be able to provide what's needed for the individuals already there. So I always tell people when they hear we're coming into a neighborhood, they hate it and they push back. And then a year or two later, they're like, wow, that was really nice. I'm glad you guys are here. It's Things are going a lot better than they were before you were here. We actually heard from Evan on Twitter. He writes, please give a couple examples of other cities that have provided encampments successfully. Is, is there someone you'd point to? Definitely. There's plenty. Uh, Denver has a really robust model that works really well that uh, we're trying to emulate. Also, Oakland is one that's really interesting to me. In the last few years, they've expanded to almost, I think, six, five or six. Um, They call them community cabins. And they just go into areas within the city proper, places that are already having, you know, groups of people living underneath bridges or in areas and in camping in tents. And they just take a piece of land, they take it over and they say, this piece of land is now going to take all these people right around here. We're going to bring them in and we're going to let them live in in a more um, ro- robust in, in the services and resources they're they're given, and mm-hmm. they, you know, it's a huge success in Oakland. Um, you know, East and West West Coast has a lot of them because of the issues they're running into. We have nothing like they do. They do have a lot more homeless people living there. Yeah, um, I but- mean, you go to LA and they're talking about sixty thousand 
people who are unhoused. Here we're talking about more like 1,500. So the other thing, that's why it's so frustrating, these are solvable issues. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice that the city now has some funding and they want to put it towards these issues. We need to get the community on board to try to, you know, emulate best practices. So in our final minute here, I mean, this is, you make a great case for this. What is it going to take to break this logjam and get to a point where you can actually do this? The funding is there. <laughs> Man, that's a great question. Um, yeah, if I had the answer, I would, we would already be doing it. I guess my, my thought is we're fighting a bigger battle of just the stigma and issue within the community on what this is. If you hear that someone's going to come in and provide services for people who are unhoused, you, you get really scared. And I think the point is that when we come in, we're going to make things better, not worse in that situation. And we want to work with the community to make that happen. And you're hoping people will open their hearts to this. Yes, we do. Anthony D'Agostino, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. Anthony is the CEO of St. Patrick Center, still not giving up on this plan. This episode was produced by Kayla Drake with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.